Welcome to Great Power Politics. In today's class, I would like to talk um, about the second uh, rising power in the international system, maybe from a global perspective, but most certainly in the context of Asia, and that is uh, the country India. So while India has been recently challenged by the, by the current uh, COVID pandemic, um, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's large size, um, it's a large and very young population, as well as its great um, advances and investment in technology uh, and service industry have shown that it becomes very quickly one of the dominant uh, powers within the region, but also very noticed on a global, um, on a global level. And so what I would, would like to do in this class is not only uh, to compare India with, uh, with its uh, uh, big uh, competitor in the region, uh, China, but rather um, kind of look at it at internal kind of structures as well as its um, outreach uh, from a global perspective to understand expectations about developments in the future uh, more and kind of get a more, more nuanced picture on what we can expect um, where uh, India is going in the, in the near, medium and long term future. So I hope you will enjoy this class and I will go right into the slides. Thank you. Okay, well, today's uh, class is, as I said, uh, on India and the, the emergence um, of India as an as a economic power is not new um, um, to all, probably all of us. But at the same time, it's often kind of seen in the shadow of uh, the development of China. And a lot of these um, aspects are, are kind of focusing on the, the current economic strengths and the, the idea how, um, how strong the GDP is at this moment. But if we kind of think about this as an emerging uh, power for the 20th century, for the later part of the 20th century, then we can see that India has lots of factors which are really interesting. And I want to take the time today um, to, to look at them. So if you have a brief overview, um, the first thing which I should notice is actually that um, India is incredibly diverse. Um, it's kind of, it has um, 29 states, um, seven union territories. It has a huge population of 1.38 billion people, um, which is the second largest in, in the world and will be uh, most likely by 2030, be the largest population in the world. Um, it's also very diverse in terms of uh, language and religion. Uh, so India has many, many different languages. Uh, 22 uh, are recognized. Uh, and in this way, it's, it's unique in the world as well because it's actually the most um, languages spoken in one, one single country. Um, having said that, um, of course, one of the maybe the the key advantages is uh, in in india is that um english is widely spoken and that makes it easier also to um to trade and uh, provide services um to the outside world um one issue uh, and i will talk about this a little bit later uh, which comes along with this is that um not everybody in india is, is capable of speaking uh, um, english very well and therefore we do have um, an entry barrier in certain jobs with, which uh, among people who speak um, uh, speak english and uh, who don't and therefore there is like a, a an issue concerning this um, english as, as a the key language for development having said that it is a, definitely an advantage in comparison to say india and uh, in comparison to say china and other countries um, in the world um, that english is widely spoken and therefore can be used relatively easily in in um, providing um providing also issues like services um to to other countries in the world um in a way india has um after china the second largest workforce so again um 
if you remember the, the lecture we had on on China, we were talking about this huge um, uh, this huge workforce and this huge ref, um, re, um, reserve workforce, so that there is not a high sh that, that there is not really a shortage of of um, workers uh, in the country, and that keeps um, this keeps salaries relatively low and therefore makes it attractive for, for other countries in the world um, to invest in in uh, China, but also in this case, of course, in India, because the expectation is that they will have uh, a, a steady supply of of labor um, in in the for the next years, and therefore, um, yeah, they therefore don't have to overly compete um, um, over employer employees. So before we actually um, go further into detail about about India, I want you to take a break already here and write down what you think uh, India, uh, where India will be um, later in the, in the 21st um, century. Will India become a global power? Uh, will it stay as a regional power um, as it is at the moment? Or will it um, um, might, might even kind of be, be um, overtaken by other uh, other players in the region. What do you think, what is your expectation about the, the development of India? Okay, guys, I hope you took some time and, uh, and wrote, wrote these points down. Uh, please upload them on the Padlet side um, or kind of share them uh, during our class. Um, I hope um, you can just, if you wrote it down on this, uh, on a piece of paper, you can just make a picture of the piece of paper and upload it as well. As well. I'm very curious to see uh, what you are thinking about this. Um, let me go on uh, and say, like, kind of give you a snapshot picture of India as an emerging power. Um, so first, uh, and we will go into much more detail, but first uh, we can see uh, that India's economy appears to be entering a self uh, sustaining growth period. Um, so in a way, this is good thing. Uh, this is a good thing because self-sustaining growth means um, that we can expect that this continues in the future. There are economically also some problems and that is um, that is the first thing is, is the agrarian crisis. So the agricultural sector is suffering. And this is, um, has been often seen as a major problem for India in terms of um, being able to feed its uh, growing population, uh, but also in terms of um, income for, for farmers. Um, other issues are that um, there's a diminishing uh, social mobility um, seen. And what do we mean by this? It's basically that um, due to the caste system, quite rigid, um, a social uh, patterns are existence in, within the society, and that means combined with the with this um, issue about language, English language, etc., means that mobility in certain social groups is very low. They're not easily able uh, to actually enter um, uh, enter enter uh, the the, um, the the workforce. And uh, or the formalized uh, workforce and move up in, on the social ladder. So in this way, this is kind of creating a social a, a big problem um, for the, the economy at large as well, because it means there's actually limited supply um, of workforce in the conditions um, they are needed in in certain parts. So there are, there are lots of um, uh, initiatives uh, to change this um, in in recent years, uh, but this uh, very long cultural uh, background um, of the caste system seems to be quite difficult to to overcome. Um, in terms of military, we could say it's also becoming a stronger and stronger power. It's mili it's kind of uh, India invested heavily into the military, uh, while it for a very long time had a especially kind of a uh, military with a large um, uh, amount of soldiers, it kind of invests more and more into high-tech uh, military as well. 
um, as well as the development of nuclear weapons, which uh, was successful. It has been kind of seen very critical by the international community, but it means that um, that India by now is a, a nuclear uh, weapon state and uh, can also is capable to project uh, its power um, with um, with the, the threat of, of of nuclear weapons, and this is especially kind of um, um, interesting. I wouldn't say interesting; it's maybe the wrong word. Um, um, especially uh, important in terms of the conflict with with Pakistan. So we do have um, a long-standing conflict between India and Pakistan. Um, which we will kind of focus on in a later class is in this uh, within this course, um, but both have become relatively recently uh, nuclear powers, and therefore are um, there's a threat of a nuclear war is at least looming in the background. Another issue um, which we will talk later on about uh, as well is the uh, increased uh, amount of radical movements. So we do have uh, movements um, uh, which are anti-Muslim or um, um, and um, and generally kind of become, want uh, a stronger uh, a stronger importance of of religion within the in the traditionally secular. Uh, democratic state of, of India, and that chain uh, bears some challenges as well. We will also talk more about this um, at a later stage in this in this course today. Um, uh, the other thing, um, which is still a very prevalent um, issue, and hasn't been been kind of completely uh, uh, eradicated. <laughs> despite uh, India's development, is the issue of poverty. Um, we will talk later about that uh, among um, the poorest uh, um, in the country, there is still issues of high levels of illiteracy um, and even uh, malnutrition, etc., which uh, seems at times surprising um, because the country in other areas is developing so rapidly. But at the same time, one of the factors, of course, is this uh, this issue that it is a very, very big country uh, with with lots of different facets. Um, so, kind of dealing with uh, with poverty will also be an important factor to understand how the country is is further developing. If we kind of talk about the macroeconomic. Um, issues here for a second, uh, we can see that over a longer period, um, the last uh, um, 18 years, we do see that um, there's, um, that growth has been constantly um, in a very high one digit, um, sometimes double digit uh, um, uh, numbers. So the average over this period is 9%, which is a very good, um, good amount. Um, of course, in uh, 2019, uh, it was a little lower at 6.1 percent, and for 2020, uh, we don't know how um, this uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is playing out in India. Um, there are certain factors which uh, would make it very difficult for the country to deal with this pandemic if it. And takes off uh, rapidly because of social issues like social distancing is, is become is, is quite difficult in in big parts of the country. Um, so we don't know how uh, the economic development will be in 2020, but probably considerably lower uh, than this, uh, which is not um, not different than most of the world. Um, of course, we know this pandemic will be. Uh, have an, uh, a strong economic impact uh, all over the world. Um, in a way, the, the per capita growth uh, has doubled um, 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 in the in recent year to 7.1 percent over like for quite a long period of the 1980s and 90s, where it was only 3.4 percent. What does this tell us? Well, it does tell us 
that individuals per capita get paid more, that they're actually more becoming more valuable, more efficient. But at the same time, um, the country is still quite a bit lower than even China. So it, it's, um, it's um, per capita income, PPP, um, is 9,027 US dollar. I think that's the number for 19, uh, 2019. Um, it ranks of uh, 118th place in the, on a global chart. Um, so it's not in the, in the uh, very high levels. And that kind of is reflecting, of course, and its issue as an um, as a developing economy, but as you see, I, I put its comparisons here. Um, China with nineteen thousand, which is of course almost like which is more or less double, a bit more than double um, of um, per capita income. Uh, Japan is thirty six thousand. The United States, at least, this is the number of uh, um, of two thousand eighteen, I believe, was fifty four thousand. Maybe this year might be uh, also considerably low. So we do see there is, um, if you kind of compare it to the 80s and 90s, we see that there has been a considerable, considerable increase. At the same time, the country is still trailing uh, behind uh, several other countries. Um, let me kind of... Okay, let me focus here on several other economic indicators. So if you look at the investment and saving rate ratio, which is often kind of seen how healthy uh, the economy is, and that's in its low 30s, which seems to um, basically mirroring other uh, modern uh, um, economies and is required for, for a takeoff of it as a developing country. Um, so in a way, that's a very positive uh, sign. Um, the current account deficit, the so domestically financed current account deficit, is in a range of two per three percent. That is quite low, or really low, and therefore it's also kind of seen as a good indicator for the economy to continue to be self-sufficient and continue to grow. Um, another aspect which is quite interesting is uh, um, is that huge in inflow of foreign direct investment in the last four years. So we have seen that this has been accelerating considerably. And maybe also one of the reasons might be that um, uh, that, that China is seen uh, may, it may be more critical um, with some kind of investment and the political system and other kind of situations seem to be quite favorable for for India and therefore we do have um, uh, increased um, um, investment uh, activities within India. Um, also, the foreign exchange reserves um, of the Indian um, uh, government are uh, are increasing and. So that means that the country is able to finance uh, projects and, and finance um, itself um, easier. And it's also all of them seem like, like sustainable macroeconomic uh, indicators, which, uh, which we could see as a support that this economy can continue to grow um, in the way it did before. Of course, um, what it doesn't reflect is um, the issue of um, of new developments like um, the current pandemic, COVID-19. Um, what impact they have um, um, is, is not kind of infected, but in itself, uh, seeing the, the economy seems sustainable. Um, private capital is also kind of becoming much more mature in India. Um, so one of the, the showcases was actually the the takeover of Corus, so a very big uh, steel company, a UK-based uh, uh, steel company, um, and it was taken over by Tata Steel. Um, with the, the volume of it was around, I think, 12 billion US dollar, which is a considerable sum, and catapulted Tata Steel into the uh, global uh, top five um, companies of, of steel companies, and that is. Uh, Maybe quite significant um, because it was a real wake-up call for the for the United Kingdom as well. So the United Kingdom, um, of course, had had very long uh, trading ties with India, 
and but for a very long time first it was the um the the colonial power and then it seemed itself more in a in a strong position when dealing uh, with india and what we do see um, nowadays is that this might actually change a little bit so that not necessarily um the uk is dictating the the terms of um, of interactions with the with the two countries, but rather India is becoming more assertive and actually also um, more powerful in negotiations there. Another aspect where we do see that India is investing in foreign markets and in this case again in the in the United Kingdom is uh, that Tata Motors actually bought uh, uh, several uh, renowned um, uh, car companies, including uh, Jaguar and Land Rover, while actually both of them are also um, doing since the takeover quite well. Um, so, so they can be seen as success stories as well for um, Indian private companies buying up assets abroad and actually developing them further. Um, so we do see that corporate Indian companies are buying on a global scale and uh, stage, and that they are becoming much more um, diverse in their in their in their business models and diverse in their in the locations they are investing. So in terms of um, foreign direct investment, we do have outflowing and inflowing foreign direct investment in, on a more or less an equal scale, which again shows that the uh, that um, the companies are these kind of um, companies are competitive on a global stage as well. And it's not only that there's an influx of foreign capital from other countries, but also that um, this is going, going out as well. Also, maybe a, a, a small side note is that in 2018, uh, India attracted more foreign direct investment than China. I'm not sure whether this is, uh, this sounds like a very strong statement, whether it kind of says as much, um, is, is, um, would need some more, uh, uh, more research. Um, but, um, well, because different uh, business and economic cycles, um, Get different kind of uh, forms of investment, and the amounts might might fluctuate based on this as well. Um, so I wouldn't overstate this this kind of fact of of 2018, but it shows that there are India and, and China are in the same ballpark if it comes for foreign direct investment. Uh, another thing is that for a very long time, the public sector has been seen as a, a, in a quite negative light um, and very inefficient. And this is not necessarily the case anymore. Um, we had uh, like a, a large uh, amount of pri uh, uh, partial uh, privatization or complete privatization um, of public sector companies. Um, but privatization stopped because of the resistance of unions and um and political actors and some of the top um indian companies uh market capitalization are um our public sector firms um so that means that they are not necessarily um in a in a bad shape that they are actually quite competitive and um and this is often also seen that um that the public sector is is doing quite well um so so we do have um um so we do have the public sector becoming increasingly um important in terms of economic uh, development as well um one of the real strongholds of india is, is its kind of science and technology uh, development it's um it's really like there is um something which is which i can kind of just highlight here as one one really part is the the access, um, the, the high technology in terms of space exploration and development to put um, satellites in, in space. I won't go um, through all the details here, um, but what it shows is really that um, India is very competitive on this level and is um, in a field which is, uh, which is very narrow in, in which countries are actually uh, kind of participating. So we can see it on one point, uh, here, I think with, with China, the EU, 
uh, Russia and the United States in terms of um, their, their space exploration and how many kind of, uh, how big the, the space program in total is. Uh, this has been criticized heavily, of course. Um, one thing is that, um, that a lot of people would say is does india really get its 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 um priorities correctly if this the country is still suffering from malnutrition of big parts of the society and uh, issues about education um issues in the agriculture um, agriculture sector etc is it really um necessary to develop a um, Base program which is competitive on a global scale, or are we talking here about vanity projects of the of the um, the government um, in order to kind of appear to be stronger than and uh, close over the over the, the problems? Um, many supporters of the space program would say that this is not the case. That actually this the funding which is used there, which is considerable, um, helps. Um, to to do further develop the high tech sector um, of India, also take um, of course kind of gains experience in terms of uh, rocket technology, etc., which is which is uh, might have some military uh, benefits as well. But also that this kind of technology area would be one of the of the future developments of India, and therefore is really important to foster it uh, for whole India. But this issue is really diverse, and I would like you to think also about this kind of two kind of situations. Yeah. Um, another indicator: India is very good in so it becomes a real hub in software development and in service um, development as well. Um, uh, so the, the the computer industry is is really on the forefront. Um, uh, on a on a global scale, and I gave you just some indicators here about the the use of supercomputers. Um, so by 2022, India wants to have um, uh, 73 supercomputers. Uh, it's currently ranked at the 22nd place on the uh, in the global top 500 ranking of, of supercomputers, uh, which used to be a bit higher, but quite some countries were beefing up their things. So once these 73 computers are, are kind of delivered, India might also be really in the top there again. And that shows, uh, again, their aspiration to be one of the top uh, countries in terms of IT technology and, um, and development. Well, in a way, uh, India, is of course um india was suffering from the the, the consequences um it uh, it was put under by the by the development of its nuclear weapons so so uh, india was pushing through in in kind of without being uh, um, an initial man, member of the non proliferation uh, uh, pact um, pushing through in developing its own nuclear weapons and that has been kind of seen very negative by the international community and also especially uh, by the United States uh, so um, so developing nuclear power without signing the NPT uh, treaty um, kind of created a lot of uh, friction uh, between the US and, and India. Uh, in recent years, this seemed to become um, less uh, less problematic um, in a way, maybe because it is more accepted that India is now a nuclear um, um, a weapon state, uh, but also because um, the United States, of course, is looking for for other uh, close allies, so closer allies within the region and therefore opened up um yeah, it's it's the, um it's interest to india much much stronger um in a way this is also kind of maybe reflected that uh, india is a democratic state and therefore it seems as a more reliable partner for the for the united states and other countries in the world as well in in terms of um um in terms of international participation um India is not very strongly um, um, uh, um, doesn't really play a very strong power position, um, but there has been for a very long time the aspiration to become a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Other members, um, other countries are kind of in the same position, including Japan, Germany, 
uh, Brazil, etc. Um, whether this is a likely scenario to happen or not is, is very hard to say. Uh, without a, a reform of the UN Security Council, it seems quite unlikely actually at the moment that uh, India would become a member of the Security Council. Uh, but uh, it is actively lobbying in this direction. It's also a member a very active member of the Doha round of the WTO negotiations. It was a really important player there. And the G20 member, the G24 member um, coalition of shared interests, it's, it's, it's in included. It's also included in member of the G8, the G7 plus five and uh, negotiations. So it has been, uh, it has been uh, seen as a, as a, a political influence on the international stage, but not very prime positions yet. However, this can of course change um, quite quite quickly, and especially I think um, if we see it uh, from the background of the of the issues around the, the NPT treaty and the US actively kind of blocking India, um, this might actually kind of in the next uh, um, one or two decades that might might change considerably. We also see a very strong soft power um, of of India with the, with its uh, driving film industry um, in in terms of, of Bollywood, which is kind of watched all over the over the world. But also that it's a very large multicultural democracy and a functioning democracy in this way um, is seen, especially in the West, as increasing. Uh, the trustworthiness of the system, also increasing its transparency, and therefore makes it more attractive as a partner. If you kind of compare, look at the uh, at the military power, we see that India is, of course, possesses nuclear weapons, as I kind of um, mentioned already before, um, but it also has a very large active duty um, duty force. Um, this is partly due to with, this, with um, uh, uh, because India is involved in several conflicts. The one is the India-Pakistan conflict, which is fierce at times and and led to the development of nuclear weapons of both countries, India and Pakistan. Um, but also because it had a very large um, 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 because it's of its big uh, population. Um, it had a, uh, it built up um, a very large active duty force, which for a very long time was not necessarily technologically very well equipped, uh, but uh, India is, is changing this um, relatively quickly and, and trying actually to reduce the, the active size, uh, but increasing the, the capacity um, of the actors. Uh, or India has also a, a quite big air force, um, and so it's the fourth largest air force in the world. And if we kind of look at, at the right hand side, we do see in a comparison between India and China, we do see um, that it does have a small armed forces than, than China, but still very, very big. Um, it has also, um, overall it has, in most parts, a little less uh, capacity uh, than China, uh, but at the same time, uh, is is still a very very strong uh, actor to to reckon with, and not just in terms of its uh, nuclear capability, but also of its conventional capability. It's one of the strongest actors in the region. Um, I have mentioned several times already that uh, if you talk about the political system, I've mentioned several times already that India is, is, um, is a democratic um, country. And in a way, it's, it's the largest de democracy in the world in such a pluralistic democracy, its existence since 1947. And as there has been frequently issues about gridlock situations where um, issues cannot easily be um, be be solved, and and the democratic system seems seems as part um, not very quickly functioning, but it has continued despite its kind of multicultural, multilingual um, country with so many different 
um, different sectors, so many different um, actors which have uh, have a variation of of interests. So this actually sh it seems to be a very kind of pro uh, a positive point of India that it is. Um, it seems politically very stable and in a way much more predictable for the outside world uh, than what we have, for example, in um, in China. Um, it also has, um, um, has, of course, key features which most, um, most democracies have and which are seen very valuable in uh, uh, by by foreign investors, especially by Western foreign investors. So um, the large and uncensored media, free speech, and especially an independent judiciary are cornerstones of a democracy, but also cornerstones of a, of a uh, for for companies in order to kind of have trust within the within the political system. Um, the the multi party politics are kind of quite um, quite strong in in uh, in India. What we do see is a big variation of different opinions and also kind of strong dispute between the different parts um, of of the country, and that is uh, means that we do to have um, frequent issues with, with violence, frequent issues uh, with, with corruption, frequent issues um, uh, with, with radical movements, etc. They are all the kind of part of it. But the, the core of the democracy seems relatively stable. Well, quite stable, not relatively, quite stable. And of course, as a democracy existence in 1947, it's actually longer continued than many many western democracies including italy uh, germany spain uh, japan so i um well this is i i mentioned already the indian military in the comparison with um with china um so it is a very large um, um, it's a very large military, also seen as a very capable military, um, and not just uh, on the uh, nuclear weapons side, but also on the conventional side. It, it seems quite quite active and growing. So lots of investment has been done into it. So what we can expect from this is that there is a stronger uh, power base of of India um, within the region um, in the next decades. Now, okay, so now we talked about a lot of the, the, the points which might uh, speak um, for, for India becoming one of the, of the global powers or at least a much stronger regional power. But there are several issues as well, and I, I want to kind of emphasize them now in this part of the, um, of, of the, of the lecture. Um, one of the, this is just an overview, we will go over this in, in, in more detail. What we do see is, um, what I want to highlight here is this is kind of this an unsustaining inequality and it seems to be growing, becomes bigger and the more India has developed. What we do see is that actually the Gini coefficient is not as bad as, as you have them in, in, uh, in many other countries of the world and including China. But what we do see is that um, we can't expect uh, that this becomes better in the in the nearer future, but rather that it accelerates. If um, India is developing further, that would very likely include um, a smaller proportion of the of the population, which is becoming wealthier, and therefore we would see a, a, a stronger inequality within within society. And that brings me maybe this is something which I had in a, in a different uh, point here. The, inequality of different castes and uh, the related violences which which go um, go together with this uh, create a considerable threat um, for the democracy uh, for social stability and also for inequality and that is one of the probably the pressing points to be addressed within Indian society in order to kind of develop uh, further Another uh, issue is the agrarian uh, crisis and the land hunger. Um, so one thing is 
this is, I, I mentioned this already before, but um, the agricultural sector within India is, is very inefficient. And um, the stability of it is also um, quite limited. So as we have, as one of the, of the few relative de uh, developing, um, strongly developing countries, India has experienced um, starvations and, and hunger in, in the bigger parts of the society. And um, so this, this issue of um, the agrarian crisis that, that um, food stability is not, um, not sufficiently um, existent, including with, with hunger, is creating another kind of um, social threat um, for India and its development. Um, one thing which is maybe more recent, and I will talk about this more in, in a minute, is the strains on the secular constitution. So traditionally, the constitution has been secular. That means a split between uh, the, the, uh, the political system and religious system. But we did have much more religious influence, especially Hindu influence, on the, on the political system. And it means that we had that a lot of political parties and political dispute have been charged um, religiously. And so we find that there is conflict between different religious groups, which is kind of spreading into the um, into the political uh, debate and becoming uh, problematic in this way as well. Um, last point, which I made, might have, uh, which I just missed, is that India has a very low literacy rate, um, and that is, has something to do with the problems of social mobility and uh, the, the caste system as well, where education is very unequally split, and some uh, many parts of uh, of India society are very well educated. Uh, and have high literacy rates, uh, good schooling, etc. But we do find that um, this is unequally spread um, within society and might um, increase uh, equality even further in the future. There's also an issue about gender uh, in this, which is uh, there in many countries in the world, but the literacy rate uh, by gender is also varying considerably. So do we see some uh, um, unsustainable inequality? I talked a little bit about this already. So we do see that, that um, the Gini coefficient went up from 0 0.32 to 3, 0.36. But in, if we put this in a global perspective, that's not necessarily a very bad value. So we could say like, well, in a, um, on a, uh, equality, inequality in India is maybe not as bad um as i kind of portrayed it here and that's true so that's not uh, at the moment it is not as bad but we do um find extreme poverty that's the one thing which we which is really problematic and the other thing is that as i said before that we do find that um, um that that um in the future we will most likely have a certain group in the population which has uh, like heavy gains from the further development while big parts of the society will not have this kind of benefit and so the Gini coefficient in the moment might look reasonable but in the in the next uh, let's say 15 years it might kind of change considerably unless there are there are kind of changes in the educational system, changes in the social structure and social mobility, um, which, which are fruitful. But otherwise, we would see a high level of inequality, which can be problematic for the country. Um, so what we do see is that uh, we had a quite high increase in the, in the um, uh, we, we do uh, well. Um, the second point um, which I make here is that at the bottom, per, um, twenty percent of the population expenditures grew by zero point eight five percent. That means there has hardly been any increase in expenditure. But at the same time, that also means that there is not much gain has come. Um, so the 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 lowest part of the population did not kind of benefit a lot from economic development. This has been higher in the 
um, in the in the top 20 percent, where it's by 3.3 per annum. Um, so we do see that the uh, from these kind of numbers that the gap goes goes um, is different and then goes uh, that the split will be bigger um, in the future, especially. Um, however, it's not as strong as um, compared to to issues which we discussed with China beforehand. Um, but this lack of growth in the in the slower in the lowest bracket is is problematic, and that shows that a lot of um, jobs are created in in uh, the higher income bracket in India, and not necessarily in the lowest bracket, which is quite different than what we see in um, in China in this way. Um, the other thing is the issue about hunger and uh, malnutrition. Uh, so we do have a, a UN report, quite old report from 2014, showed that 15.2% of Indian population has been in, uh, under nutrition. So that means that a considerable part of, um, of the population doesn't get enough food on a regular basis. Also, in terms of if you look at the continuous place, the global hunger index, uh, ranking uh, ranked India at the, from 2019 ranked India on the 102nd uh, place of 117 countries they looked at so really really at the bottom of it and hunger and nutrition of the um, of the poorest in the country is one of the big challenges as I mentioned already before for the, uh, the country. Um, Well, I talked quite a bit about the, the agrarian crisis already and the high level of um, inefficiency. There's also a big part, which is kind of that the, um, um, that there is like a, a very big informal sector of employment, which is not necessarily kind of covered by most of the of the of the government programs. So, seventy five percent of the employees are in the informal sector. Um, in the agrarian uh, agri agrarian sector, and they don't earn minimum wage or anything like this, and live in precarious situations. What we do say, what I want to highlight here is that um, this kind of especially includes some of the um, um, of the of the the lowest classes within within society, and the caste system is kind of kind of uh, confining them within this uh, within this sector so it makes it much harder to actually kind of uh, um, have social mobility within the thing so this is especially if, uh, focusing on the Dalits um, uh, 88 percent are in the agricultural se sector and therefore are very kind of um, kind of vulnerable to malnutrition and poverty um, Another issue which which we do see is is very high levels of um, um, of violence um, in the country, and it's kind of what we do see is like politically um, the, um, politically motivated violence um, resurgent of left wing uh, move, armed left wing movement. Um, there's also caste related violence be between the different um, the different groups, and one. Um, and especially also what I mentioned already before, um, tensions between Muslims and and Hindus, um, that maybe the, the 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 sad highlight of this was the Gujarat program in 2002, where almost 1,000 people died, um, uh, and many many have been injured, and these kind of tensions are frequent, not necessarily so bloody as, as at the time, but these kind of tensions seem not to kind of decline and seem to be a, a key issue in the on the domestic political side. Another highlight which has been become uh, more known on a global level is that is um, our, our kind of strong gender issues and especially the issues about rape. Um, where, where several cases have made the international news. And um, what we do see here is, is though that there has been much more a stronger protest by, um, by women's groups um, and um, 
and then a, a quite strong anti-rape movement, uh, which uh, seemed to make the issue much more, or the population much more aware, uh, and hopefully kind of finds fruits uh, in in reducing the numbers of um, of rape and other sexual violence against women, which is a, is quite um, um, quite high within India. Of course, these issues um, are not unique um, to India alone. Many countries are struggling with them, um, but the prevalence is is problematic for an for for the development of the country. So I leave it here, and um, thank you uh, for participating in this. Session.